Tag the Eve August Falcha. Hi, hello, and welcome. It's John O'Sullivan from the Irish Pagan School. And today I'm going to be dipping into the Irish mythology to share with you something that we get a lot of questions about. And unfortunately, there are no answers to it. And that is the lost knowledge of the healing herbs of Ireland. So if you're interested in that, do make sure you stick around. Thank you very much for being with us, all of you who kind of have done the liking and the subscribing. There are a lot of people who haven't subscribed, and that's totally fine. It is down to how you choose to interact with the media that we're producing. Um, we would, of course, prefer that because then we can make sure that we're popping up and getting you the data that we really want to be sharing out there that we want to kind of be connecting with um so again thank you very much it's really really appreciated all the comments and all the questions because it really helps you know keep, keep us going and keep us at this so Gaurav Mila Mahaka, thank you very much um so yes talking about the mythology and the healing herbs it is something we get asked about a lot and unfortunately there is no clear answer but I, what where does this actually come from? Like, why is this one of the most common questions that we come across? Why do people wonder, do we have a list of these mystical or magical herbs and what they do? And it is because there once was that knowledge. According to the Lerigabala era in the Book of Taking of Ireland, specifically the segment of the saga known as the Kathmag Tura, the Battles of Maitura, um, we find that there was one god in Ireland who was the god of healing and kind of, it's referred to as a leech, which is this kind of healing, but also surgery as well. And that was Dean Kecht. Um, so much so we see him time and again when the first war is coming up against the Firbolog as the two of the Danon arrive into Ireland. One of the things that swings the battle in the favor of the two of the Danon time and again is the fact that any wounds that their warriors suffer, if they're not a mortal wound, is just restored to them every evening. And the way that it is done is because Dean Kecht and his children, who are experts in this knowledge of healing arts, would create a healing well. It was said that they would kind of create a space, fill it with water, and they would cast into that well all of the various herbs of healing, and then they would cast incantations upon the well, which were turning into this healing spring. And so any warrior who was wounded during the day's battle, every evening would come home, they'd be put into the, the well, and they would come out refreshed, restored with no wounds upon them anymore. And the only wounds that could not be restored were mortal wounds, as in the, the serious kind of wounds, as in most commonly that we see in the lore as loss of a head. Um, as much as there's this concern around portraying the ancient Celtic ancestors as barbarian head taking kind of individuals like that was the practice so much so that during the first battle of Martura, it's actually listed who was slain on what particular day and that their head was taken back. They, they actually took the, the, the trophies really to show that they completed a deed on both sides, on the two of the Danon and on the Firbolog side. Um, and of course, the, the plane of Moitura is referred to again as the plane of pillars, because there's these various pillars that each side would erect to have their kind of sorcerers up on top, their prophets up on top. And some of those pillars would be kind of have trophies or skulls placed around them. Um, so it was a practice. It was part of the, the nature because, again, that was a mortal wound. It was something that could not be healed or could not be overcome. So. That's our reference to it. We then see it again on the run-up to the second Battle of Moitura, where we have the Fomorians um, facing off against the, the two of the Danon in their conf conflict for ascendancy in Ireland. Um, but in between that period, we have the incident with Nuada. So if you don't know anything about Nuada, he's known as Nuada Argetlov, which is the silver hand or silver arm. Um, because during the first Battle of Moitura, he got... He, engages in one-on-one -on -one combat with the champion of the fur bullock known as Shrang, son of Slenga. And in their single combat, Nuada loses his arm. Now, he is taken away from the battlefields very quickly. In fact, it's the Dagda who kind of breaks through the fur bullock lines and stands over protecting Nuada until he can be recovered and taken away. And of course, he's brought straight to Dean Kecht. And Dean Kecht can restore most of the harm upon him, but he can't restore the missing arm. And so when the battle continues, Nuada returns to the field and he only has one arm and he offers combat again against Shrang. And Shrang, he says, listen, to make the fight fair, why don't you bind up one of your arms and we'll fight like with one arm each? And Shrang is like, 
it's not my fault you lost your arm. Why should I be at a disadvantage? Because you couldn't fight properly the first time we fought. Um, which again, absolutely fair, uh, which I absolutely love for this kind of idea of the structure of martial combat. You know, there's all of this kind of romanticized, idealized version of like, you know, oh, honorable duels, honorable one on one combat. I will bind up my arm and we shall fight evenly. You know, to be honest, why? <laughs> it's not at Shrang's fault, really, that Lua had lost his arm the first time around. Um, but Nuda was king, and this is where we kind of get more information about Dean Kecht and the power involved, because Nuda was king amongst the two of the Danon at that time, but because he lost his arm, it was considered a blemish, as in a physical imperfection upon his form, a, a formal blemish would made him no longer fit to be king. So this kind of leads to Nuda being deposed and makes an opening for Brest to become king, who doesn't act fairly, doesn't act honorably, which then leads to the second battle of Moitura. But in between those two conflicts, we see that, you know, Nuda has not been idle. He's not king, sure, but he's still a recognized champion and chieftain amongst the people. And so Dean Kecht gathers to him Lukta. Uh, no, sorry, it's not Lukta. Lukta's the right, it's Krejna. So Krejna is one of the three Dini Dana, the three gods of skill. It's Gwivna the smith, Luxa the rice, or a woodworker or a carpenter. And then you've got Krejna the brazier, which is also like this fine metalwork or jeweler almost. And so Krejna and Dean Kecht get together and by their mixing skill in jewel craft, engineering, um, understanding of biology, they make a silver arm. And that is then attached to Nuada. So Nuada gets the silver arm and it is said of the arm that it had all of the motion of a regular hand, of his normal arm, of the arm that he lost, except of course it was made of silver. So this is where he gets, Nuada gets his name, Argetlov, um, which I think is absolutely awesome. And you could take as a, a first rep mythological representation of prosthesis and use of prosthesis, which I think is brilliant. Um, because again, someone having a disability doesn't make them invalid or like not accepted within the community. Even though he was a king and he has a blemish, he's still part of the tour. He's still part of the tribe. He still is taken care of, catered to and looked after. Um, and so they want to do as best they can to restore anyone that they can give restoration to. So that is considered an, an amazing feat of engineering, but also leechcraft or like, you know, medicine. And Nuada is then re restored and he's in this champion position or chieftain position amongst the two of the Danon while Brest begins to rule. But of course, as I've mentioned, Bress is not a good king. He's overly critical of the two of the Danon. He favors kind of his Fomorian heritage more so. He has a bias and he allows that to cloud his judgment and offer poor hospitality. So I know I'm kind of talking around it, but there's a lot of small stories. There's a lot of small, very impactful stories in between the two conflicts that clarify or justify why it goes to that conflict and this is the next time where we find this mystery of the healing herbs because Dean Kecht had a son and a daughter he had a couple of sons and daughters actually um, and his most skilled son was a guy called Miek and Miek kind of saw the silver arm that had been made for Nuada and though it was great he was like it's not good though like, surely we can do better. Surely we can find some way to remove the blemish and restore what has been lost. Um, and so Dean Kecht is like, nope, that's the best that can actually be done. So Mir goes off and he finds the missing arm. He finds Nuada's lost arm. And it says that he places healing herbs upon it. He kind of binds it in healing herbs. And then he binds it against his own chest for a period of time until the arm is ready to be reattached. And so he then goes to Nuda with Nuda's original arm, which has been restored and preserved. There's no corruption upon it. And through his skill and through his art, he is able to restore to Nuda his own arm, which means that the blemish the, is removed and that, that makes Nuda fit to be king again. Now, this is an amazing kind of experience. It's, it's over and above any knowledge or content that, of medicine or leechcraft that existed prior to Mirk doing it, um, which doesn't sit well with Dean Kecht. 
because Dean Kex was, you know, the leech, the top, the top dog. So as I've mentioned in kind of the video talking about Lou, which is on the channel, if you're interested about Lou, when Lou actually comes to the hall, when he comes to Tara, Bress has been deposed, Nuada has been restored as king because of the actions of Mia. He's no longer blemished. Lou arrives and Lou lists off all his talents, his skills, everything he's good at to see if he can get past the door and be allowed into the court of the king. And there we see, you know, the mention of Dean Kex again, because Lou lists himself as a leech. He, he actually uses the word leech, which is this kind of chief in medicine and everything. And he's told, I'm sorry, we don't need you. We have Dean Kex inside. Now, it's interesting to me that they still say they have Dean Kex inside as the best of the best, even though Nuda is now sitting on the, the seat of the king, having been restored not by Dean Kex, but by Meek. And we find out why that is because of, unfortunately, the tragedy and pridefulness of Dean Kecht. Um, because, as the story goes, when Dean Kecht finds out about the restored Nuada, he is incensed that someone could outdo him. If someone could outdo his knowledge of surgery and medicine. He just can't hack it, can't find it. And he goes and confronts Mirk and he's in a rage. And so he attacks Mirk. And he places a wound upon him and Mirk just heals it straight away. He actually just, you know, he, he latches into him with a sword, I think it is, and Mirk just restores the wound. And so Dean Kex goes at him again and cleaves into him, kind of causing a more severe wound. And Mirk kind of heals it again. So Dean Kex, knowing that, knowing that he's up against it, he goes for the wound that cannot be healed, which is mortal wounds. And so he lays in and he strikes for his son's brain and he kind of smashes into his head and harms the brain which should be game over but Miak still is able to heal that wound and so even in this conflict between father and son Miak is showing that he's able to outdo his his father in this art of healing and his knowledge of healing and so Dean Ketz goes completely off the rails and he, he full-on slays his son and he buries him and that is the end of Miak as far as Dean Keck is concerned. But there's one other person in this story that needs to be considered, and that is Miak, Dean Keck's daughter and Miak's sister, Armage. Armage is another one of the goddesses of the two of the Danon who is very much linked with healing and very much linked with the care and compassion for those who are ill. Because Armage kind of finding out where Dean Keck is buried, Miak goes to mourn and she goes to grieve her brother. And what she finds instead of a kern or instead of a gravesite is a whole collection of herbs. All of these herbs, all of these kind of plants have sprouted and grown from Miak's grave. And they are the herbs of healing. It is the actual specific herbs that are linked with every individual part of the body that is good for healing that part of the body grown upon his grave above that part of the body. So not only is it the herbs themselves, it's actually herbs with the map in essence like you know you'd use this herb for healing the arms this for healing the stomach this for healing the head all of those herbs grew from me grave it was this kind of last gift that he could give passing on the knowledge the knowledge that he had of healing any form of wound or any form of harm and so armage Armage knows the value of this. She reads it straight away because she has the skill and she has the knowledge to do so. And so she takes off her skirts and her, her guna and she kind of lays it out and she begins to harvest all of the herbs and to place them in order so that she can know this herb is for this, this herb, so she can carry on the knowledge that Miak has actually given. And that's how she begins to kind of continue the healing arts from her brother. Unfortunately, the story doesn't end favorably because Dean Keck catches on to like Armage's ability having improved, her knowledge of herbs having improved. And so he begins to become suspicious. And so one day he follows Armage as she goes off to harvest herbs again. And he comes upon her with, again, the skirts laid out and kind of harvesting the herbs from her brother's grave and placing them in all the necessary positions to keep that knowledge there. And Dean Kecht flies into a rage again. And it says that he completely cast aside all of the herbs and her kind of her clothes and everything. Like, you know, anywhere that she had the knowledge marked down, he completely destroyed it. He ripped up the grave, ripped up all the herbs. And it says that he cast them across the world so that knowledge of healing could only be held by 
Now, at this point in the story, there's that slight shift because the translations we have do come from monastic settlements. Um, and so it's put in that true knowledge of healing can only be held by, you know, the one true God, you know, which is in essence, this kind of Christian bias being brought into the narrative, but it doesn't take away from Dean Keck being so prideful in his pursuit of knowledge and power that he casts aside all of the healing wisdom and all of the healing herbs. And so that is the tragedy. That is the sadness. Like we know from all of the stories that there was a power in Ireland to heal any wound that was not a mortal wound. We know that like, you know, the Dagda had this power as well. When Kermit was slain, he placed like herbs upon Kermit in order to prevent the corruption of his body until he could find a way to bring back the, the life that had been lost. So there was a lot of kind of information in there. And anyone who hears this tale invariably gets like, but, but do we know what, what the herbs were? Do we know, you know, where, what herbs do what? And the answer is no unfortunately we don't so there is a lot that has been done in regards to you know relearning you know the holistic kind of skills around herb lore and around herbology it's been a lot that has been passed down now also there's a lot of science been done around like you know the like distilling this knowledge and trying to find it so i'm not a person who will say that you know only use holistic circumstances like the purpose of science is to actually question is to find out ways to do things better, smarter, but there is also the, the understanding that we don't have all of the answers and it's worth pursuing to find more of those answers as we go ahead. So much like, you know, many people who are fans of the ancient mythology and the ancient wonders of the world get very frustrated when we don't know what was lost in say the library of Alexandria. Those of us, you know, book nerds out there really feeling that there's also the loss of that knowledge of healing herbs, the loss of that kind of ability and that skill to overcome such harm to our human mortal bodies or even divine bodies in that case, because we're dealing with gods or, or well, they were manifest in the world before they went into the hollow hills and became the people of the she. Um, so yeah, unfortunately we don't. <laughs> um, and it is one thing that we get asked about, but I think it's often fascinating to consider the story to consider like the, the why are we still telling the story why is has it been remembered through all of these generations and brought down is it purely about this loss of knowledge this loss of kind of healing experience or is it more of a story about intergenerational kind of knowledge and wisdom and unfortunately pride holding that back like Dean Keck is not the good guy in this story um, and also when I kind of look at it, I, I feel a, a deep sorrow in me for Armitch because how easy is it for her to grieve her brother knowing that the person who slayed her brother is her father? So she gets caught in between these kind of toxic male behaviors of aggression and dominance and pride. Um, so that is the story there for us today. Um, I, again, I wanted to kind of come back to do a bit of a mythology touch in and to check back with those kind of questions. And yeah, I do teach a class on Dean Kecht and the Children of Healing over at the Irish Pagan School. So if you're interested, do go over and check that out. If not, do make sure you're hitting the likes and the subscribes here. Um, so you get bells for notifications when the new videos kind of drop. And as ever, Gaurav Mahagat, thank you very, very much for being with us and enjoying these series of videos. And uh, until next time, look after yourself. Goodbye. Salon.